Copyright in these lectures is either owned by the ANU or a third party who has licensed the ANU to use it. Students may use the recording for personal study only. No lecture may be communicated online, copied or shared without the prior permission of the ANU. Hi everyone. So, we're going to finish the last slide from the lecture and then we're going to go into the assignment workshop. Just to bring everyone up to date um, on Macquarie infrastructure and on Transurban, in case some of you weren't here during the lecture, what we're doing is we're showing, uh, we're giving two examples of infrastructure stocks that show that you can't just paint all infrastructure pro uh, projects with that archetypal, overly positive view. Right, a good infrastructure project is very valuable, but all of the trade people tend to think of when they think about infrastructure, which is very attractive, it doesn't always happen. So you need to be careful when you pick your projects. So remember, we had two different stocks here. We have Transurban and we have Macquarie Infrastructure. They are both set up um, to invest in toll roads. Macquarie Infrastructure is actually no longer in existence, it was taken over by the Canada Pension Plan. But what we said at the end of yesterday is even looking at the statistics, you can already see that they don't conform perfectly to that archetypal view of infrastructure. We said that the standard deviation of both Macquarie and Transurban was well above the S&P 200 equity market. So that view that all infrastructure projects are low risk when it comes to an actual, uh, in this case, listed infrastructure investment, isn't necessarily the case. We then said, well, it's fine to be high risk in isolation, as long as that risk can be diversified away. So we then moved to the beta, and we said, all right, well, Transurban's beta is fairly low at 0.44. So that does mean it is potentially a good diversification stock or infrastructure investment, but Macquarie, the, the beta of Macquarie Infrastructure Group is 0.73, right? So that's an infrastructure investment essentially behaving very close to equity. And then we finish this slide by saying that the third view, so we've now said, all right, they're not always low risk. They're not always a good diversifier of equities. And the, another view of infrastructure is that they're defensive. And we said that if you look at this chart, that's not the case as well necessarily, because in the GFC, when the equity market went down, both companies dropped, Macquarie Infrastructure Group in particular. Okay, so clearly you can't always conform to that rose-tinted glasses view of the asset class. On top of that, this is an example of some of the individual uh, investment-specific risks that can occur. What you see here is no longer total return, it's return relative uh, to the S&P, 200, which is why the line isn't going up. But if we start with Transurban in the blue, Transurban has been a good infrastructure investment. It has outperformed the equity market, right? It typically has always been above one, and the line has been going upwards over time. Particularly in the last sort of 10 years, it's been doing very well. But early on, it had a lot of issues that are good examples of project and development risk in infrastructure. So for example, early on, uh, in about 2000, one of its major projects was the Burnley Tunnel in Melbourne. And I think I mentioned yesterday that part of that tunnel is built on sand. And as the sand shifted, there were cracks in the tunnel when it was first built, and water came in, and it looked like they'd have to redo it. And in the end, it turns out they could repair it. But while this was going on, you can see the share price took a dive. Earlier before that, they'd actually also had some issues with their contractor and they were actually gonna sue them for damages. They recovered from that as well. But so you can see a specific project risk can affect the performance of these investments. Macquarie Infrastructure Group is a bit different. So they got off to a really good start. They operated in about seven different countries, they had about 10 different toll roads. So you can see that early on, performance is fantastic. It then really starts to go down the drain. And actually
actually what happened with Macquarie isn't the, invest, the infrastructure project issues. It's issues in the way that the Macquarie infrastructure group was set up. One of the things is it had actually quite a clever management fee. At least it was good for the managers. In that Macquarie infrastructure group got management fees as long as the performance of the stock was going up, irrespective of market movements. So have a look, you can see from early 2000s, Macquarie is losing ground compared to the S&P 200. But if you have a look at its chart up until the GFC, even though it was losing ground relative to the equity market, it was still going up, so management fee was still taking a cut. And that actually ended up, it was good for managers for a while, but it ended up being a big drain on the company's performance. It was over levered, it had trouble securing funding, and in the end it was acquired by the Canada Pension Plan. Okay, so these are just two examples of the fact that even a company set up to invest in toll roads, the classic infrastructure investment that seems so safe isn't necessarily going to be the case. So it's important that you pick your projects carefully or that the manager has skill in picking the projects carefully. So that's it for infrastructure. Any questions before I move on to the assignment? All right. So the focus of the assignment today is going to be the quantitative analysis. I've been getting a few questions which I'm actually really pleased to be receiving because I'm, I'm receiving them earlier this semester than I typically do, which means that you guys are getting on top of the project earlier than people sometimes have in the past. So that is really good to see. The questions I'm getting show that you're working hard at getting those Excel sheets ready and natural issues are arising, which it's always gonna do. So I've incorporated a number of those questions, anything that can be applied to the class in general, I've incorporated them in here today, and I'll continue to do so next week as well. So we're gonna start with looking at some pointers on the Excel analysis, how to set up the spreadsheet, and two different types of quantitative methods. We're gonna look at a bootstrap, and a rolling hypothetical portfolio, and we're gonna talk about the data that's appropriate to each type of method. We're gonna talk about which, uh, which Excel videos are good references to help you with the assignment. And then we're gonna finish by talking about how to backfill hedge fund, hedge fund data, as well as some answers to some extra specific student questions that I couldn't neatly slot into the other sections. And then if I have any more time at the end, you guys are welcome to ask any questions that come up. Or ask as we go, by the way, that's fine too. So let's start by talking about the type of quantitative analysis that you might wanna do. Essentially, you're gonna typically choose between, well, you will choose between two things. You're either gonna choose a bootstrap or you're gonna choose to have rolling hypothetical portfolios. Remember, we've looked at them both through the course. The reason I say rolling hypothetical portfolios is remember you've got quarterly data or annual data, but you've got a four or six year holding period depending on the client. So you need to take the quarterly or annual data and compound that data up to either four or six year returns. Now we have a, depending on the data series you pick, what, 20 odd year data period? Now you split 20 years of data into non-overlapping periods and you're gonna have five data points, which you can't analyze. So what you'll do is you'll take your quarterly or yearly data, I'll show you, you'll compound it up to four or six year data, depending on it's four for Abigail, I think, six for Robert, and then you'll just roll that data down one period at a time. Okay, so what we're doing at all points is we're saying, well, what are the two methods that will balance the number of data points we need with what's suitable for the purpose given the data that we're using? So the first thing I wanna do, because I've been getting questions on do I use simple returns or do I use log returns to calculate compound returns, is show you an Excel video, uh, sorry, an Excel file that is on your wattle. Now, this is the only Excel file that I'm going to upload 
The reason is that the other two Excel files are modified snapshots of some potential solutions, and I'm obviously not going to give those to you because I want you to do it yourself, right? But this isn't a potential solution, it's something I've set up to illustrate the point. What I've done is I've taken the data from Excel video 2, and I've essentially used simple and log returns to show how either calculation can be used in a bootstrap to compound up to end value, as long as you use the right formula for the purpose. So I have an explanation you'll see here that you can read in your own time. We've got the base data from sheet 2. Then in part A, remember, we calculated simple returns here. And then from the uh, weights that we had, we used the sum product function to get the portfolio return. The first thing I want to remind you of is that you have to use simple returns in a sum product function. Don't use log returns. It's not equipped to do it that way. You need to use simple returns. You can then take your simple portfolio return and calculate the log return from that. Okay, so we've got simple returns, the portfolio return based on the weights, and then in the bootstrap, we have simple returns straight from the uh, calculation in part A, and we have the log of the simple return. So you can use either a simple portfolio return or a log return to get up to your compounded return, but remember you had two different formulas and we looked at those in workshop week three, from memory. All right, so you ran your bootstrap, this is all from Excel video one. And then what you can see here is you have the exact same portfolio value generated over five years. In the first one, you're using simple returns. In the second, you're using log returns. You can see either way will get you the correct answer, but you need to use the formula that's fit for the purpose. If you have simple returns, then you need to use, there we go, you need to use the geometric calculation shown here, so you've got one plus the first simple return times one plus the second simple return, and so on. That's fine, except for the fact that here it's doable because you have five data points. In a yearly bootstrap, it's doable in your assignment because you'll have four or six data points, depending on which investor it is. But if you wanted to do that for your quarterly analysis, you'd either have to do it 16 or 24 different times which is obviously quite tiresome to calculate in Excel. It would be a long formula. You can do it. It'll give you the right answer. But because that is tiresome to calculate, people often use their log returns, right? So this is the log returns here. And then they can simply say, the compounded value of your log returns is the exponent of the sum of the row. Get you the same answer but it means you can just drag it across, which is much easier, particularly when you're using quarterly data. Okay, so the answer is you can use simple or you can use log to compound up to your four or six year values. It doesn't matter, providing you use the correct calculation. And if you ever want to be sure that it is correct, why don't you do both and check that it's getting you up, the, the calculations you're using are getting you to the same number, right? Because that's how I know I'm using the right calculation for the purpose. Well, it's a nice check to confirm that you are. Any questions on that? All right, so that's the first thing. The second thing is which uh, quantitative analysis am I going to pick? And by the way, I've had a couple of questions on whether you only have to do one type of quantitative analysis, whether you only need to use one data frequency. The answer is yes, but remember what I said last week. You only need to pick one method if you want to pick two, you are welcome to do it, and you'll have to decide how to trade off the allocation that comes out of the two methods to end up with your final recommendation and which numbers you report. That's extra work. If you do it well, it may earn you extra marks, but it's not gonna do it just because you took the time to do the extra work. It needs to add value, and it is valuable to do more than one type of quantitative analysis, but you also need to include that in your report, which is gonna take up more words, and you don't want to lose words that you could be using in qualitative analysis and justifications. So there's no one right answer, it's trade-offs. 
but you will not lose any marks for only using one quantitative method using one data frequency. It is possible to get full marks using one quantitative method and one data frequency as long as the rest of your assignment is also of a, you know, 100% quality. Does that make sense? So do it if you want, go for it. You're never gonna get more than 100%, by the way. Um, but you don't have to. All right, so you've got two methods. You've got a bootstrap or a historical hypothetical rolling portfolio. The first thing you're gonna ask yourself, and we'll ask this first before I go into showing you Excel examples, is what interval am I going to use? Now, luckily, there is a really nice match between interval and method in terms of both convenience and assumption. So let's say that you're going to use yearly data. So if we go back to the Excel file I just had up, yearly data, in this case, we had it from 85 to 16. Anyway, this example is 85 to 16. Obviously, your assignment finishes in 2017. Uh, but that is 32 data points, right? So 32 data points on yearly data does not give you a lot of data to analyze, which undermines the statistical power of your tests. So if you're happy, if you choose to use yearly data, one way of getting more observations is through running a bootstrap, right? Because if you chose to use rolling portfolios, You'd need, let's say for Robert, you'd need to use six years of data to get your first six-year compound return, right? So that shaves 60, it's not even 32 data points, right? Because you've got six data points into one. And then your second six-year return would be the next. You'd roll it down, the next six data points. So there's a benefit instead to using a bootstrap because suddenly you have, however, if it's Robert, six years of returns and hopefully 10,000 observations. Right? Remember I said before that should you use 1,000, it's better to use 10,000. It gives you a, a more complete picture of the distribution. But your computer might take a while to do it. Don't freak out, just go and have a coffee and relax. Then come back. Some of you probably know that very painfully already. So, if you want to use yearly data, it makes sense to use a bootstrap because it gives you more data points. Luckily, the reverse is also true in terms of what's appropriate for a bootstrap. Can anyone remember what's the key assumption in a bootstrap? IID returns. Now, you're never going to have exactly IID returns. You're typically going to violate the assumption a little bit, but yearly returns is more likely to be closer to IID in our circumstances than quarterly. Can anyone think why there tends to be a, more of a violation in quarterly returns for IID? Yep, serial correlations through things like appraisal valuations and thin trading. We have a liquid asset classes in our data and we have unlisted asset classes in our data. And these asset classes tend to therefore have smoother returns over quarterly intervals than they do over annual intervals. So there might, yes, be a little bit of serial correlation in your annual intervals, but typically less than what you'd have in your quarterly data. So if you choose to use a bootstrap, yearly data makes sense rather than quarterly. So that's the first method that we're going to look at. We're going to look at a yearly bootstrap. Then we're going to look at uh, using quarterly data. And here, it makes sense to use hypothetical rolling portfolios as opposed to a bootstrap because of that assumption under a bootstrap of IID returns, which is more violated using quarterly data. So if you want to use quarterly data, it makes sense to use hypothetical rolling portfolios. Now that said, if you use quarterly data in a bootstrap, that is your choice, and that's fine. Right? There's no one right way to do this stuff, but you need to acknowledge the weaknesses of your methods. So if you are using quarterly data in a bootstrap, I would expect to see a note that there is an assumption of IID returns and why you think it's still appropriate to use a bootstrap. Perhaps you might have looked at the correlation of your data, um, whatever it may be, but you need to acknowledge any weak, uh, shortcomings in your analysis. So this is a snapshot, which I'm not going to upload, obviously, um, of some of the potential solutions I've created for the assignment. There is no one right solution. I have removed any asset allocations from this. I want to show you the method. I don't want to freak you guys out by thinking you need to give an asset allocation that I want. There's no right answer. 
So you will not see an actual recommended portfolio, but I want to show you how you might start to set up the analysis, if you haven't already. So let's start with the yearly bootstrap. We have our yearly data that you're given in the assignment, and you're given return targets. It, uh, remember, they're contained in the Excel information spreadsheet for the assignment. Now, remember, you've looked at, you're given expected returns. You've looked at how to adjust expected returns in two ways. You've done it using simple, that's in week five, uh, sorry, Excel video four, I think. And you've done it using log returns in Excel video, I think, two. I've written it in the assignment uh, workshop outline for today. So you've got a choice. What do you do? Do you adjust simple? Do you adjust log returns? As you can see, I've adjusted log returns here, and I've actually made, I think from memory, a note of that in the assignment outline. Here we are. In Excel video two, you're adjusting the geometric mean, which is more relevant for generating target returns over multiple periods. Right, in this case, you've got yearly data, and you're compounding that up to be, end up as either four or six year returns. So if you use simple, rather, uh, a simple adjustment on an arithmetic average rather than a geometric mean, you will overstate your return. So what do you do? You have, what, the way I set it up is I calculate the simple returns here from the yearly data. From that, I convert them into log returns. So this is the log, a historical return. I've only split it into two steps to make it a bit easier to show you. I then calculate the mean of the log return. This is exactly what we did in Excel video two. I have the target return, which is a simple return. So I calculate the log of that target. The difference is my adjustment factor. Right? Again, this is exactly what you did in Excel video two. You're just applying it to a new case. So I now need to adjust the log returns based on the mean adjustment factor for each asset class. So you take every return, and in this case, to negative 2.3%, I then, no glasses, subtract 0.92, right? And you do that all the way through. But remember, and that's what you see here, within the brackets, right? In that gray shaded group. But remember, you can never use a sum product function on log returns. So once you've adjusted the log return, you need to take it back to simple return, which is why you then have the exponent of the log return subtract one. Okay, so you adjust the log return and you convert it back to the simple return. And you could have done that in two steps if you prefer. All right, so that's your return adjustment. Notice I have made no recommended portfolio adjustments here. This is just to illustrate the method. So I now have my adjusted returns which I will apply using whatever weights, uh, we've got the existing weights for, is this four years? Uh, this would probably be, oh yeah, four year bootstrap. So this is the weight for Abigail. Existing weights, I have no adjustments, and the comparison group weights. That gives the adjusted returns based on whatever weights that you're gonna use, and that might be, for example, through Solver or the portfolio analysis workhorse. You plug those weights, into the bootstrap for the number of years, and by the way, you should use equal returns across the years, don't downgrade the probability of the GSC or anything. Equal rotates across the years, which you then, just like you did in Excel video one, use a VLOOKUP function that you link to your random number generation to get the, in this case, simple returns. Yeah, I've used simple here. Simple returns that are adjusted in line with expectations that then you apply the correct formula to and then calculate your annual equivalent, right? That's exactly what uh, you did. It's a combination of Excel video two and Excel video one. Now what I wanna, I'll actually have listed this at the bottom, but the other thing I wanted to say is that you can run Solver directly through a bootstrap. The problem is what you wanna do is let's say, and I'm not gonna do the calculations because that's up for you guys to do, but let's say you have return, tracking error, etc. cetera. Um, probability of loss. And you're gonna calculate these from your bootstrap. 
right? You've got uh, the return from the bootstrap, tracking error from the bootstrap, probability of loss from the bootstrap. By the way, let me say something quickly about tracking error and standard deviation before I forget. If you have a look at the way your constraints are worded, everything's about a four-year outcome, so if we stick with Abigail, um, four-year outcome, compound return of 6.5% over the next four years. But if you have a look at volatility, she has asked that standard deviation not exceed 8% per annum based on yearly returns. And the tracking error constraint of Robert is the same, based on a yearly return. For standard deviation and for tracking error, you don't want to use the four-year annualised returns. You want to use yearly returns. For the rest of it, you look at the four-year annualised. But you look at yearly for standard deviation and tracking error, because if you look at four-year annualised returns, you will understate your risk. So that's why if you have a look uh, at this, the way that ooh, this spreadsheet is set up, I've got the calculation for Abigail's existing portfolio, the calculation for the comparison group, but I've also got the current portfolio versus the peer over one year, the current portfolio versus the peer over, uh, sorry, the adjusted portfolio versus the peer over one year, because when I come to calculate, say, the tracking error, which you don't need to do in Abigail's case, but you do for Robert. The tracking error is a standard deviation of the difference in returns between you and the benchmark. That's not the difference in four-year annualised returns. It is the difference in yearly returns. So you actually want to calculate the standard deviation of this full 4 by 10,000 box. You don't calculate the standard deviation of this row because right, it's got to be on yearly. It's just something to note. Okay, so anyway, what I was saying is you can't, unfortunately, tell Solver, tell me which weights, using this tab, that will give me the right figures in this tab. In other words, you can't get Solver to read two different Excel spreadsheets at once. You want everything you need to be contained in the one spreadsheet, which is why some people think that they can't use a bootstrap with Solver. You can, but what you do is you go into your yearly analysis tab and you link it back to the bootstrap. So somewhere here, you'll have a box Oh, damn, sorry, I had already hit. Yes, yes, that was right. All right, so, I'm just being lazy, sorry about that. Um, so somewhere here you're going to have, create a box and say the return is equal to, so you're linking it into the outcome of your bootstrap. So then you can say to Solver, all in the one spreadsheet, you can say, all right, Solver, Tell me the weights that will satisfy the conditions that you specified here, but those conditions are linked into your bootstrap. Does that make sense? Right, so you can still use Solver through the bootstrap, you just need to create a box that actually brings, uh, picks out the values that matter that you've taken from the bootstrap figures. And then Solver will actually optimize straight through the bootstrap and pop out a number that's optimized for the bootstrap figures, not the annual figures. Okay, so that's some of the things to think about when running the bootstrap on yearly data. The alternative is to look at quarterly data and do hypothetical rolling portfolios. Now again, this is Abigail, so this is gonna be four years. For Robert, it would be six. The first thing to realize, so again, I've got simple returns here. This is blank, I'm gonna show you next how to fill in this data for hedge funds. I've got simple returns. And I do a, the same thing. I calculate simple returns, which I convert to log returns. I calculate the average of the log return for my return adjustment. But remember, you were given uh, annual target returns. So you need to make those quarterly. This is really bad of me because I have value pasted these in, which I shouldn't have done, right? Don't submit anything with a value paste. 
What instead you should do is say equal one plus the historical return, because I need to check you've calculated this, well, your marker needs to check you've calculated it properly. So you say one plus the historical return, and then what would you do? How would you get these to quarterly? Four? So what have I, what do I need to do instead? That's the one? Yep, so you're right, it's, uh, you, quarter, you use four to make it quarterly, but it's to one over four, right? So you've converted from the yearly to quarterly. Then you, your log quarterly target is the log of your annual, uh, sorry. This is your quarterly target. You then take the log of your quarterly target. You compare that to the average of your log quarterly returns. And then you've got your adjustment factor. Okay, so exactly the same thing as you did for yearly data, but everything is converted to quarterly frequencies. Then again, you adjust and take it back to simple returns before you apply your sum product function. And that gives you returns for Abigail's existing portfolio, the recommended portfolio, which I've just left the same as the existing portfolio for now, and the comparison group. So the next thing here is to calculate your rolling returns. Now remember how I said the nice thing about using log returns is that rather than doing this complicated thing, you just get to say exponent of the sum and then you drag the cells that matter. If you have a look at the quarterly analysis, the first thing I do is I take the log of one plus a simple return. <coughs> Sorry. That way, when I calculate four-year compounded values from quarterly returns, I can just say exponent um, sum and drag uh, t15 to t30, right? Otherwise, I would have had to say uh, one plus t15 times one plus t16 times one plus and so on and so on and so on and so on, which you don't want to do, right? So that is your four-year value from quarterly returns. And then all you do is you roll it down one quarter at a time to keep the number of data points. From there, you convert it to a four-year return. So a 16-quarter rolling return, but you annualize it. So in other words, what I do is I say, all right, let's get the return, that's over four years, take it to the power of one on four to give me my annualized quarterly return. That's exactly what you did in the bootstrap. Here, right, so you see there, it's similar, it's just setting up the spreadsheet in a different way. So now you've got your four year returns annualized. And you can see you've also got projected four quarter rolling returns. So rather than four year returns annualized, you've just got annual returns. Remember, why do we also have to calculate annual returns? Standard deviation and tracking error, right? So you'll take most of your measures using four year returns annualized, but the standard deviation and tracking error constraints need to be yearly returns. And then you can run solver, you can use a portfolio analysis workhorse, whatever you like to calculate your measures. Any questions on that? All right, so a couple of other things. So that's the interval. In terms of what assets you want to consider, you don't need to include every asset class in your recommendation for the client. Right? You'll typically include all of the asset classes in your analysis because the comparison group has weights in all the asset classes. But don't feel like you have to recommend a weight in everything. Think about what's relevant for the client. Is there an asset class that they can't access or they shouldn't because of the challenges of manager selection and access, like we looked at yesterday? Uh, so you can be more strategic. You might want to recommend an asset class for which you don't have data, and a good example of that is infrastructure. That's not necessarily, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't recommend infrastructure. You might want to build a proxy or, or obtain one. If you want to use other data, that's fine, as long as it's from a reputable source and you actually cite what that source is. 
But in the case of infrastructure, I've told you that I'm very happy for you to, to just proxy infrastructure using the returns of direct property, right? So in, maybe instead of uh, recommending a 12% direct property weight, you might want to take some of that weight and put it in infrastructure. It's up to you. Or if you want to include data for uh, an asset class for which you don't have data, or you think the data is poor quality, have a look at the methods used in the two-stage approach because you might want to bring what's done in the second stage of the two-stage approach into the qualitative part of your analysis, and that would be fine as well. But remember, whatever you end up doing, you do need to actually have output that will fill in the output put table of Excel. So things do need to come back to the figures. I wouldn't recommend an asset class for which you have no data and you don't build any proxy whatsoever, because then how are you going to figure out the performance? But it is fine to, for example, proxy infrastructure using direct property if you would like to recommend an infrastructure weight, which you don't have to do. Obviously, you can tell there are a lot of choices here. I don't want to restrict what you guys are doing. The best assignments are typically ones where students have really taken ownership of their choices and run with it. They've got creative, they've got excited, they haven't tried to do exactly what they think I want them to do. They've challenged themselves. And remember, I'm not going to be I might mark a small section of the assignment, we're still fig uh, figuring that out based on the time frame we have, but I'm not going to be the only marker of the assignment. I'll make sure there's consistency, by the way. What I always do is I never have it so that one person marks a third of the assignments. What I'll do is I'll create one section of the assignment that one person will mark for everyone. Right? That's the only way I can make sure that all of the groups are marked in a consistent way. So it might be that one marker marks all of one part, another marker marks all of another and someone come, and I might come over and look over the top for consistency. Uh, you've got to decide your periods, and you've got to state it in the report and justify why you selected it. Now, for a lot of people, they're just going to look at the data that's available, and they might decide that they want to use all of the historical data up to the point where they have data on every single asset class. So, for yearly data, that might be December 91, because of inflation-linked bonds, unless you want to find a way to backfill, and if you do, you need to justify why you used it, and ideally have a reference. For quarterly data, I would have said, well, the problem with that is you couldn't start it until 1999, but I'll actually show you a way to backfill hedge fund data today, so you might start your quarterly analysis in 1991, again, because of inflation-linked bonds. Or you might think there's been a structural break and you want to start your data a little bit more recent, but remember there's always a trade-off. You don't want to have such a short sample period that you don't have many data points to work with. Now what I have here is a list of, uh, it's a breakdown of the different Excel videos and what you've learnt in them that you might use for the assignment, right? So Excel video one, you've got bootstrapping. Excel video two, you've got optimization. You've got um, adjusting expected returns using logs. Excel video three, you look at what data to use in terms of measurement interval and time period. Video four, you look at making adjustments to the asset allocation through, say, qualitative considerations and how that would impact your output. And you, you adjust expected returns using simple returns rather than log, which isn't appropriate for the assignment. Excel video five, you look at calculation of rolling returns using shorter interval data. So all of those, look at what you do and learn how to modify it for the individual cases in your assignment. Now the next thing I wanted to do is show you how you can backfill hedge fund data. Now I would have loved to leave this until next week where we actually look at hedge funds, but I, I don't want to prevent you guys working with hedge fund data until next week for your assignment. So I'm going to show you how to do it, but then we're going to talk about the method in next week's uh, lecture so you'll get a better understanding of why you adjust in the way that you do next week. But I want to show you the method now so you can keep going. If you're using, if you're using yearly, you don't need to worry about this. But if you're using quarterly hedge fund data, the trouble is it only starts in 1999 and that's a very short period from which to take your analysis. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually backfill the quarterly hedge fund data to the start of when the yearly data is available for hedge funds, which is 1989. Because the benefit, the trouble with backfilling is it's only ever a guess. But the benefit of backfilling hedge fund data here 
is that we know what the yearly returns are. So we're not completely doing this blindly. We're just, we know the yearly returns. We're just proxying for the breakdown for each of the four quarters of that year, which actually helps us in terms of the accuracy of our backfill. Now, what we're going to learn next week is that Ibbotson, Chen, and Zhu do a paper called the ABCs of Hedge Funds, where they model hedge fund returns using the beta on three different return sources, the return on equity, bonds, and cash. And they give you the beta of the hedge fund universe for each of those asset class returns. So you don't need to run regressions. I am fine for you guys to use the betas that the paper gives you. And you're going to apply these betas to the returns on world equity unhedged, world fixed income, and Australian cash. So let me show you. So you've got March 1989, and you're going to say, well, the model predicts that the return on hedge funds is the equity beta times the return on world equities, plus the fixed income beta times the return on world fixed income, plus the cash beta times the return on Australian cash. That gives you your simple quarterly estimated return in step one. And you do that obviously for each period. Make sure you lock in the betas obviously. Now, that gives you four potential quarterly returns, but we actually know what the hedge fund yearly return is. So we, rather than using these exact quarterly returns, we're going to use them to calculate the weights at which we split the actual yearly return across the four quarters of that year. Does that make sense? So we're going to use these to calculate percentages. So the first thing we're going to do, remember because you're compounding quarterly values up to a yearly value, is we have to calculate the logs. So you've got the log of the quarterly returns, the log of the yearly return. And to get your final quarterly return, what you're going to do is you're going to say, well, for the first quarter of 1989, I am going to attribute a proportion of that return, a proportion of the actual yearly return, based on the split that I've calculated from my model. Right, so what you're saying is, well, the proportion of the first quarter out of the whole year is 0.0505 divided by the sum of all four quarters. And then you're going to, so you, that is your weight, and then you times it by the log of the yearly return, and that gives you your final quarterly log return. You do the same thing for quarter two, the same thing for quarter three, the same thing for quarter four. They're your logs. You need to convert them back to simple returns. So you take the exponent of the log return and subtract one. And what you now have is simple quarterly returns that will compound up to equal 18.1%, which is the actual yearly return for that hedge fund, uh, for the hedge fund data series. When you do that, it will enable you to backfill the quarterly hedge fund data until the actual data starts. And, up, and obviously, once you have quarterly data, that's what you use. So you're only backfilling the period from 89 to 99. 89? Yeah, 89 to 99, based on that method. Right, so we'll talk about why you're using those betas next week, but that actually shows you how to calculate it for, your, for yourselves. Obviously, if you use yearly data, don't worry, but if you use quarterly data, that actually gives you an extra decade of data points, right, rather than lose a decade of data for all of the other asset classes as well. Any questions on that? All right. So I've actually stated here, I've just spoken you through the steps of what we're doing and why. Now, by the way, remember, you need to cite any data sources that you use in the assignment. You need a list of references. You will be marked down if you don't have it. And the reason is that you don't ever need to cite the lecture, note, lecture notes, but you should be using outside sources. That might be independent research, or it might be drawing on things like using the betas in Ibbots and Chen and Zhu. It might be using a fundamental risk approach. Uh, it might be using some of the methods that we did in week five, or the supplementary readings. If you use uh, any information other than what we do in class, you need to cite it properly using the Harvard referencing method. All right, so additional student questions that I've had. The first is, can Solver be run through the bootstrap? I answered that already. Yes, it can, and that's what I showed you in Excel. 
The other one, and I'm, I apologise, I probably should have told you this in the assignment itself. Some people are getting a, a, a bit concerned because I've given you exchange rate data for yearly and quarterly frequencies. And so I've been asked, do we need to use that to convert, say, world equities or anything? The answer is no. My guess is most of you will not use the exchange rate data. You don't have to. But the reason I've included it there is in case in your qualitative arguments, you might get so excited by what we do in week 10 in determining the optimal hedge ratio that you might want to tweak your weights in world hedged and unhedged world equities based on an analysis of the exchange rate. I won't mark you down if you don't. I don't expect you to do it. But some groups really do want to apply what we do in week 10. And that's why I've given you the exchange rate data just in case. But I don't expect you to use it. And again, I won't mark you down if you don't. Because that tends to be people's concerns. They don't, they don't want to not do something without realizing that it will end up in a penalty in the mark. Now, there's one other question that I got on my way in, so I didn't have a chance to incorporate it. And that is, when you did Solver in Excel video 2, you didn't include cash in the optimization. So the question was, do we not include cash in the optimization here? You do include cash in Solver as another asset class. The only reason we left out the cash return in the optimization is that we used it to help us essentially as a risk-free rate proxy, right? When we were looking at things like sharp ratios. But no, you should in this case include cash just like every other asset class when you're determining your weights through Solver. Uh, we've got about four minutes. Any other questions that you want me to answer here? What I'm going to do next week, um, I'll answer any, any more quantitative questions you have, but I'll also start to look at a bit of qualitative analysis and also there's not much I can tell you how to do in qualitative analysis without giving you potential solutions. But the other thing I'll look at is things like the marking rubric and the presentation. All right, thanks, guys. I hope it's going well, and I'll see you on Tuesday.